Neil Young. No, that's Jimmy Fallon imitating Neil Young. Doing impressions can be a valuable skill. In fact, a bird called the fork-tailed drongo makes a good living at it, in its home in Africa's Kalahari Desert. The drongo can mimic the alarm calls of another bird. When that bird flees the imagined danger, the drongo swoops in to take any food left behind. An animal mimicking another animal is not rare. And targets can grow wise to the trick. The drongo's real talent is that it can do the warning calls of multiple species. Like how Jimmy Fallon can also do Van Morrison. Researchers followed 64 wild drongos for nearly 850 hours. Drongos do sound accurate alarms in response to actual predators. But when they spot a tempting meal in another bird's possession, they send out a false alarm. Here's one mimicking a pied babbler. Another a glossy starling's alarm. And here's a drongo mimicking a meerkat alarm. The researchers saw almost 700 drongo attempts to steal food. They estimate that any one drongo might know up to 32 different species alarms. And stolen food accounted for nearly a quarter of their daily intake. The study is in the journal Science. Fool birds once? Shame on them. Fool birds multiple times? Success for the fork-tailed drongo. Neil Young. No, that's Jimmy Fallon imitating Neil Young. Doing impressions can be a valuable skill. In fact, a bird called the fork-tailed drongo makes a good living at it, in its home in Africa's Kalahari Desert. The drongo can mimic the alarm calls of another bird. When that bird flees the imagined danger, the drongo swoops in to take any food left behind. An animal mimicking another animal is not rare. And targets can grow wise to the trick. The drongo's real talent is that it can do the warning calls of multiple species. Like how Jimmy Fallon can also do Van Morrison. Researchers followed 64 wild drongos for nearly 850 hours. Drongos do sound accurate alarms in response to actual predators. But when they spot a tempting meal in another bird's possession, they send out a false alarm. Here's one mimicking a pied babbler. Another a glossy starling's alarm. And here's a drongo mimicking a meerkat alarm. The researchers saw almost 700 drongo attempts to steal food. They estimate that any one drongo might know up to 32 different species alarms. And stolen food accounted for nearly a quarter of their daily intake. The study is in the journal Science. Fool birds once? Shame on them. Fool birds multiple times? Success for the fork-tailed drongo. If you like a glass of wine with your pizza, you might be interested in the news from this week's American Chemical Society meeting in Chicago. First, the bad news. It seems that a growing number of winemakers find that their reds, whites, and rosés taste a little like... Mm, ladybugs. These cute little aphid eaters are becoming quite a nuisance in vineyards across the country, where they accidentally get harvested with the grapes and stink up the resulting wine. Chemists at Iowa State University used a gas chromatograph and a panel of human sniffers to analyze the odor produced by hundreds of live ladybugs. They found the stench was made mostly by chemicals that smell like roasted peanuts and green peppers, which maybe nobody wants in a delicate Chablis. But there's good news about pizza. Chemists at the University of Maryland have figured out how to boost the antioxidant levels in pizza dough. Maybe that discovery will catalyze a whole new generation of bad foods that are good for you. Potato chips that clear your arteries, or brownies that deliver insulin. Until then, at least we've got the antioxidant deep dish, which we can always wash down with a nice glass of Ladybug Merlot. If you like a glass of wine with your pizza, you might be interested in the news from this week's American Chemical Society meeting in Chicago. First, the bad news. It seems that a growing number of winemakers find that their reds, whites, and rosés taste a little like... Mm, ladybugs. These cute little aphid eaters are becoming quite a nuisance in vineyards across the country, where they accidentally get harvested with the grapes and stink up the resulting wine. Chemists at Iowa State University used a gas chromatograph and a panel of human sniffers to analyze the odor produced by hundreds of live ladybugs. They found the stench was made mostly by chemicals that smell like roasted peanuts and green peppers, which maybe nobody wants in a delicate Chablis. But there's good news about pizza. 
Chemists at the University of Maryland have figured out how to boost the antioxidant levels in pizza dough. Maybe that discovery will catalyze a whole new generation of bad foods that are good for you. Potato chips that clear your arteries, or brownies that deliver insulin. Until then, at least we've got the antioxidant deep dish, which we can always wash down with a nice glass of Ladybug Merlot. Oh. 2002 was a tough year for the people who live along the shores of Lake Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It started off with a bang when the Niragongo volcano erupted in January, and it tailed off with a shudder when a magnitude 6.2 earthquake struck the region in October. Both events devastated local communities, and their close timing struck some scientists as suspicious. We were wondering if there could be a link so a causality between those two major geological events. Christelle Wattier, a geologist at Pennsylvania State University. From studying radar images of the ground taken before and after the January eruption, Wattier knew that lava didn't just spew out of the volcano. It also wedged itself into cracks in the crust, forming what geologists call a dike. So you can think of it uh, as like a blade-shaped type of magma intrusion moving from depths toward the surface. It's very fast, a few hours, a few days, and it can penetrate tens of kilometers of crust. Dikes are common in rift zones like East Africa and Iceland, where tectonic forces are slowly ripping Earth's crust apart. And they're known to cause small earthquakes right when they happen. But Watier wondered if dikes might also be capable of triggering large earthquakes by pushing the ground apart and affecting nearby faults. You will add more stress on a weakness um, surface, which is a fault. And so if you add enough stress on it, you can trigger failure on the fault. Now, Watier and her colleagues have used a model to show that the stress changes caused by the January dike event made the October earthquake much more likely to occur. The results are in the journal Geochemistry, Geophysics, Geosystems. This study marks the first time scientists have linked dike formation to large, damaging earthquakes, and Watier is looking back through history for more examples. She says researchers will never be able to predict exactly when an earthquake might strike after a dike intrusion. But at least now, researchers and rift zone residents know they're not just in for bangs, they may also be in for shutters. Oh. 2002 was a tough year for the people who live along the shores of Lake Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It started off with a bang when the Niragongo volcano erupted in January, and it tailed off with a shudder when a magnitude 6.2 earthquake struck the region in October. Both events devastated local communities, and their close timing struck some scientists as suspicious. We were wondering if there could be a link so a causality between those two major geological events. Christelle Wattier, a geologist at Pennsylvania State University. From studying radar images of the ground taken before and after the January eruption, Wattier knew that lava didn't just spew out of the volcano. It also wedged itself into cracks in the crust, forming what geologists call a dike. So you can think of it uh, as like a blade-shaped type of magma intrusion moving from depths toward the surface. It's very fast, a few hours, a few days, and it can penetrate tens of kilometers of crust. Dikes are common in rift zones like East Africa and Iceland, where tectonic forces are slowly ripping Earth's crust apart. And they're known to cause small earthquakes right when they happen. But Watier wondered if dikes might also be capable of triggering large earthquakes by pushing the ground apart and affecting nearby faults. You will add more stress on a weakness um, surface, which is a fault. And so if you add enough stress on it, you can trigger failure on the fault. Now, Watier and her colleagues have used a model to show that the stress changes caused by the January dike event made the October earthquake much more likely to occur. The results are in the journal Geochemistry, Geophysics, Geosystems. This study marks the first time scientists have linked dike formation to large, damaging earthquakes,
and Watie is looking back through history for more examples. She says researchers will never be able to predict exactly when an earthquake might strike after a dike intrusion. But at least now, researchers and Rift Zone residents know they're not just in for bangs, they may also be in for shutters. A coal mine can degrade its local environment. But a fungus may inadvertently help clean up the mine, with its own waste products. Researchers worked with a fungus called Stilbella aciculosa. As it makes spores, it also produces superoxide. That's a highly reactive kind of oxygen. When the released superoxide bumps into the mineral manganese in the environment, it makes that mineral much more reactive itself. The pepped-up manganese then grabs and holds a variety of toxic metals and other substances that need to be cleaned up and taken out of coal mine drainage water. The research, led by Colleen Hansel of Harvard and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's been known that various bacteria and fungi can help in environmental remediation. The new research shows that production of the vital forms of manganese requires that the fungi and bacteria be actively producing superoxide. So creating conditions that encourage the organisms to make the superoxide could be the first step in a pathway by which they help manganese to literally do the dirty work and make some toxic sites a lot cleaner. A coal mine can degrade its local environment. But a fungus may inadvertently help clean up the mine, with its own waste products. Researchers worked with a fungus called Stilbella aciculosa. As it makes spores, it also produces superoxide. That's a highly reactive kind of oxygen. When the released superoxide bumps into the mineral manganese in the environment, it makes that mineral much more reactive itself. The pepped-up manganese then grabs and holds a variety of toxic metals and other substances that need to be cleaned up and taken out of coal mine drainage water. The research, led by Colleen Hansel of Harvard and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's been known that various bacteria and fungi can help in environmental remediation. The new research shows that production of the vital forms of manganese requires that the fungi and bacteria be actively producing superoxide. So creating conditions that encourage the organisms to make the superoxide could be the first step in a pathway by which they help manganese to literally do the dirty work and make some toxic sites a lot cleaner. When we lie, our brains work hard to make sure we get the story right and come off as truthful. Law enforcement officials try to tap into that effort, for example with polygraphs, to find out if a suspect is telling the truth. But such stress tests are beatable and not admissible in court. Now comes a report that handwriting tests could be a competitor to the familiar, but unreliable lie detector. The study appears in the Journal of Applied Cognitive Psychology. Researchers at Israel's Haifa University worked with 34 volunteers, who wrote truthful and false paragraphs on paper using a wireless electronic pen and a pressure-sensitive tip. A computerized system measured pressure and stroke duration, both on the paper and in the air. Spatial measures, such as stroke length, height and width were also tracked. And the scientists found significant differences in pressure and spatial measures in deceptive statements compared with the truth. The investigators say they need to validate this initial result and compare the technique with polygraphs and other lie detection tools. But perhaps in the future even a written claim of innocence could turn out to be a de facto confession. When we lie, our brains work hard to make sure we get the story right and come off as truthful. Law enforcement officials try to tap into that effort, for example with polygraphs, to find out if a suspect is telling the truth. But such stress tests are beatable and not admissible in court. Now comes a report that handwriting tests could be a competitor to the familiar, but unreliable lie detector. The study appears in the Journal of Applied Cognitive Psychology. Researchers at Israel's Haifa University worked with 34 volunteers, who wrote truthful and false paragraphs on paper using a wireless electronic pen and a pressure-sensitive tip. 
A computerized system measured pressure and stroke duration, both on the paper and in the air. Spatial measures, such as stroke length, height and width were also tracked. And the scientists found significant differences in pressure and spatial measures in deceptive statements compared with the truth. The investigators say they need to validate this initial result and compare the technique with polygraphs and other lie detection tools. But perhaps in the future even a written claim of innocence could turn out to be a de facto confession. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Adam Hintertour. Got a minute? The toucan's long bill has long perplexed biologists. Darwin theorized that it attracted mates. Other suggested uses ranged from fruit peeling to territorial defense. But a report in the July 24th issue of the journal Science offers another explanation as to why one-third of the bird is all schnoz. The authors of the report say the toucan's bill is so big because it acts like a radiator strapped to its face. When a toucan needs to cool down, its beak heats up. The immense surface area of the beak allows heat to quickly dissipate. In fact, the scientists say as a toucan lowers its body temperature in preparation for sleep, it can cool 10 degrees Celsius in just minutes. The scientists use infrared thermography, the same kind of technology used in heat sensing cameras, to observe toucans at different ambient temperatures. When outside temperatures rose, the bill also heated up, but the bird's core body temperature did not. The scientists speculate that other big-billed birds may regulate their body temperatures this way. Since birds don't sweat, having a handy heat dissipator undoubtedly keeps their feathers from getting ruffled. The heat is on. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Adam Hintertour. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Adam Hintertour. Got a minute? The toucan's long bill has long perplexed biologists. Darwin theorized that it attracted mates. Other suggested uses ranged from fruit peeling to territorial defense. But a report in the July 24th issue of the journal Science offers another explanation as to why one-third of the bird is all schnoz. The authors of the report say the toucan's bill is so big because it acts like a radiator strapped to its face. When a toucan needs to cool down, its beak heats up. The immense surface area of the beak allows heat to quickly dissipate. In fact, the scientists say as a toucan lowers its body temperature in preparation for sleep, it can cool 10 degrees Celsius in just minutes. The scientists use infrared thermography, the same kind of technology used in heat sensing cameras, to observe toucans at different ambient temperatures. When outside temperatures rose, the bill also heated up, but the bird's core body temperature did not. The scientists speculate that other big-billed birds may regulate their body temperatures this way. Since birds don't sweat, having a handy heat dissipator undoubtedly keeps their feathers from getting ruffled. The heat is on. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Adam Hintertour. Londoners love their fish. And according to a new study, in the early 13th century they suddenly started importing it from as far away as the Arctic near Norway. The research is in the journal Antiquity. About the year 1000, sea fishing increased significantly in northern Europe. To see how that increase influenced urban growth, researchers looked at 95 excavation sites in London, which included about 3000 bones from cod fish. Cod are decapitated before being dried for transport. So finding heads meant the fish were local. And the researchers found that as fish heads appear to decrease in the early 1200s, fish tails dramatically increased, a sign of importation. Examination of the chemical isotopes in the tails matched those for fish in waters far to the north, probably off Norway close to the Arctic, more evidence of import. The scientists do not know if the rapid switch from local to imported cod happened because local fish weren't as plentiful as the population increased, or if the market became flooded with dried imports from the north. But these fish tales tell a story of London becoming a growing economic center, and part of a globalizing fish trade. Various studies have suggested that eating garlic can be good for you. It's been credited with lowering blood pressure, protecting against heart disease, preventing blood clots, even fighting off colds. 
Now researchers from the University of Alabama at Birmingham think they have a better idea how garlic might work its medicinal magic. The Alabama team exposed red blood cells to the juices pressed from a standard supermarket-issue clove of garlic, and they found that the garlic-soaked cells started giving off hydrogen sulfide, which is the gas that gives rotten eggs their delightful bouquet. Okay, I know you're probably thinking that smelling like sewage seems even more odious than reeking of garlic, but on a molecular level, a pinch of hydrogen sulfide can be just what the doctor ordered, because hydrogen sulfide serves as a chemical messenger that helps relax blood vessels and increase blood flow which could explain some of garlic's cardiovascular benefits. Of course, more studies are needed to show whether a clove a day really does keep the doctor away. In the meantime, enjoy your garlic bread, and don't worry about the garlic breath. Just think what the insides of your arteries must smell like. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Various studies have suggested that eating garlic can be good for you. It's been credited with lowering blood pressure, protecting against heart disease, preventing blood clots, even fighting off colds. Now researchers from the University of Alabama at Birmingham think they have a better idea how garlic might work its medicinal magic. The Alabama team exposed red blood cells to the juices pressed from a standard supermarket-issue clove of garlic, and they found that the garlic-soaked cells started giving off hydrogen sulfide, which is the gas that gives rotten eggs their delightful bouquet. Okay, I know you're probably thinking that smelling like sewage seems even more odious than reeking of garlic, but on a molecular level, a pinch of hydrogen sulfide can be just what the doctor ordered, because hydrogen sulfide serves as a chemical messenger that helps relax blood vessels and increase blood flow, which could explain some of garlic's cardiovascular benefits. Of course, more studies are needed to show whether a clove a day really does keep the doctor away. In the meantime, enjoy your garlic bread, and don't worry about the garlic breath. Just think what the insides of your arteries must smell like. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. For those interested in preserving the environment, this week brings sobering news about ethanol. This fuel, distilled from plants like corn and switchgrass, has been widely touted as an eco-friendly, clean-burning alternative to gasoline. But a study published this week in the journal Environmental Science and Technology suggests that replacing our current gas guzzlers with vehicles that burn ethanol would actually increase pollution and damage human health. Stanford scientist Mark Jacobson used a computer model to predict air quality in the year 2020, when ethanol-powered cars are expected to be widely available in the U.S. His simulation showed, among other things, that cars that burn a blend of 85% ethanol will significantly increase ozone, a prime ingredient in smog. So in a world where the cars run on switchgrass juice, more people will get asthma, more people will be hospitalized with respiratory distress, and more people will die from breathing in ozone than if we'd kept on driving our gas-powered clunkers. At least according to Jacobons. So if you want to celebrate Earth Day this weekend, raise a glass of bubbly to our beautiful planet. Just don't share any with your gas tank. For those interested in preserving the environment, this week brings sobering news about ethanol. This fuel, distilled from plants like corn and switchgrass, has been widely touted as an eco-friendly, clean-burning alternative to gasoline. But a study published this week in the journal Environmental Science and Technology suggests that replacing our current gas guzzlers with vehicles that burn ethanol would actually increase pollution and damage human health. Stanford scientist Mark Jacobson used a computer model to predict air quality in the year 2020, when ethanol-powered cars are expected to be widely available in the U.S. His simulation showed, among other things, that cars that burn a blend of 85% ethanol will significantly increase ozone, a prime ingredient in smog. So in a world where the cars run on switchgrass juice, more people will get asthma, more people will be hospitalized with respiratory distress, and more people will die from breathing in ozone than if we'd kept on driving our gas-powered clunkers. At least according to Jacobons.
So if you want to celebrate Earth Day this weekend, raise a glass of bubbly to our beautiful planet. Just don't share any with your gas tank. How frequent are nightmares for toddlers, and what causes them? Those are questions researchers at the University of Montreal hope to answer. They asked parents of about a thousand children to estimate the occurrence of their child's nightmares from age two and a half through age six. The parents were also questioned about their child's disposition. First, it turns out that nightmares aren't so frequent. About a third of the parents reported no nightmares at all. And then there's the second result. Kids who were called difficult as early as five months were more likely to suffer from nightmares as toddlers. And the ones who at a year and a half were more anxious, more likely to cry, and more difficult to calm down were also more likely to have bad dreams. The study authors say this means children may be, well, like little adults. It's already well established that adults tend to express real-life stress and emotional problems as nightmares. The researchers suggest that focusing on the kids' daytime issues, and on parenting techniques, may help banish nighttime demons. How frequent are nightmares for toddlers, and what causes them? Those are questions researchers at the University of Montreal hope to answer. They asked parents of about a thousand children to estimate the occurrence of their child's nightmares from age two and a half through age six. The parents were also questioned about their child's disposition. First, it turns out that nightmares aren't so frequent. About a third of the parents reported no nightmares at all. And then there's the second result. Kids who were called difficult as early as five months were more likely to suffer from nightmares as toddlers. And the ones who at a year and a half were more anxious, more likely to cry, and more difficult to calm down were also more likely to have bad dreams. The study authors say this means children may be, well, like little adults. It's already well established that adults tend to express real-life stress and emotional problems as nightmares. The researchers suggest that focusing on the kids' daytime issues, and on parenting techniques, may help banish nighttime demons. <laughs> 